Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and with me in the Rabbit Hole studio today is a very talented, lovely filmmaker slash actor, Miss Tammy Minoff. Welcome, Tammy. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here and uh, talk to you about you, all this. Did you like my uh, my late show introduction? I, I, was, I really <laughs> did. I felt very validated. <laughs> I was going for I was going for the Leno on that one. I, I think um, it worked. Well, I, I do try. I'm getting better at this uh, at this interviewing thing. I've been doing this for a little while. Um, but anyway, um, we don't have a ton of time, so I wanted to jump right in. Let's do it. Uh, first, um, we're going to talk about your movie. Yes. Um, but we're also I want to talk about you first. Uh, so, okay. So talk about how, because uh, you started out as an actor. I did. Uh, talk about uh, how you uh, got into acting, how you got into filmmaking. Like, what is your origin story, so to speak? It's my origin story. I feel like a superhero. Um, I So my career started as an actor in musical theater, which uh, is not something in my, in my life everybody knows, actually. I started as a kid in New York, this lovely city that we're in, and I grew up doing theater, I grew up doing musicals, and I actually worked on Broadway, um, which is uh, a unique experience. So um, my teachers, my first teachers were some pretty cool people. Um, Neil Simon is one of the people I worked with, and so uh, he's probably one of the best comedy writers in my humble opinion he's got a pretty good reputation he's he's okay <laughs> he's, he's pretty um, good so I, I worked with him on a show called the goodbye girl with bernadette peters and martin short marvin hamlish wrote the music it was like really big awesome talented people wait who did you play in that show i played lucy mcfadden who is the girl i played um if you know the film that it was based on that's the marcia mason part that's right uh and her daughter you played the daughter That's of the, right. Oh, so you were in it with Bernadette? That is right. Oh my she was god. My mom. Oh my god. Wow. <laughs> that is a Goodbye Girl, which is a w- lovely movie if you uh if you're studying romantic comedy, uh see that film. It's probably I agree. Would you say it's a little dated now? Yeah, in some ways, yeah, but it's a um, be- you know, it's a beautiful movie. So, I think that Look, great romantic comedies, I think they hold up. So I, I don't know. I don't know if um, what people will think about some of the themes in it because it's uh, but it's a beautiful movie and it's funny and real. And you you have to be willing to go to go back into this. Is, it's from the 70s. So you got to like and so New York and too. so New York. And it's vintage uh, Richard Dreyfuss, Marsha Mason. And he won the uh, Oscar. For he it. won the Oscar. Yeah. Youngest man ever to win an Oscar at the age of I like. Didn't even know that. Yeah, I think he was like 29 wow. Wow. at the time. Um, that's another very interesting story. But okay, so so I did the goodbye. You girl. You had the Broadway bona fides, uh, right? And, and then, so we were doing that, and so I started. Um, to have the movie making bug and eventually made my way to LA was doing a lot of independent film as an actor was doing commercials was doing a little bit of theater but I really I missed theater and I was taking a class and a guy named Chris Messina who's an actor was there and I ended up in this kind of like improv thing with him and I wrote um, a monologue and he encouraged me to keep writing and so I wrote a play and that play was the subject matter for my first movie, Limerence. Great, uh, Limerence. Um, I now you you do not live here. You are I don't. direct. So you, sorry. I have I've flown you in fresh <laughs> like a lobster from from L. A. Uh, to come. No, no. She she was here for the Soho International Film Festival. That's where we met. Where her film uh, feature film Limerence was uh, How does was New playing. York premiere. New York premiere, which, which was is exciting. Very exciting. Uh, so you're kind of coming back home. Yeah. With that film in so many ways. So, so in this film, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You're a uh, director, yes. writer, producer, lead actor. Yes. Uh, you're doing a total Orson Welles on this thing. Um, I'm talk- tired just thinking about it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, uh, uh, it's one of those things that uh, whenever somebody, because I've been approached by several actors recently yeah. to develop projects with yeah. them, and they're like, should I direct it? And I always tell them no. <laughs> That's the right advice. Uh, but, mostly. Mostly. But um, talk to me about, uh, talk to me about Limerence. And first of all, what is the movie about? 
and then the, t- talk talk. To, <laughs> that's the eternal question. Right. Uh, talk to me about what what is it about, and and what were some of the challenges that you had, yeah. kind of going from behind the camera to in front of the camera, and and vice versa. Yeah, um, I think. Uh, well, first, let me say my producing partner, Brad Zions, who produced Kissing Jessica Stein and Iron Abbey and some other movies, he saw the play and it was his idea to adapt it into a film, um, which I said, great. Um, and when we were in that process, uh, it was also his idea for me to direct it because he'd been through this experience before working on that on Kissing Jessica Stein, which had actors who were in it, who had written it. Actors who were in it, right? Actors are in it. Actors who had written it and did not direct the movie. And he really felt that this um, was my project. And at the end of the day, when it's your baby, it's really hard. Because we were talking to directors about directing it. Um, It's really hard to give those reins over to someone else when you have the vision uh, to do it. So we didn't know exactly how it was going to go because I'd never directed before. But uh, it was kind of one of those moments where everything in my life that I'd been working on had sort of led me to this moment where I thought, oh, right, this is what I work with actors, I coach actors, and I'm the person on set as an actor who's paying attention and who's behind the camera and who's really, really loves collaborating and is not just waiting to be told what to do. Um, so I, I, I was very lucky in that some of the independent films I worked on, I really was a collaborator with the director, the DP, the producers, they involved us as actors. And so I think that was some of my training for it. What is the movie about? Well, the movie, the simplest um, answer to that is it's about love and it's about falling in love. And it's about um, art. The main character is a painter and what happens to one's creative process, which there is a big parallel in my own life as we were making this, what happens to the creative process when you're falling in love or when your relationship is struggling? And what happens, the, the word limerence, which some people don't know, um, is about the, it's, it's the honeymoon phase. It's when you're obsessed with that person. And um, in today's uh, day and age, you really want them to text you back. And um, that what happens in that time, like when you create, when you're in the throes of that with somebody. And it unfortunately is a finite thing. It does fade. And I think most people who have been in a relationship have experienced that to a certain extent. And what happens to your art when that changes? And then we also look at unrequited love, different, I think, really universal themes and thing and Questions I, I can't answer. I don't know if anyone can answer. So I think the movie asks a lot more questions than it gives answers to. Well, you know, every movie should be able to solve the dilemmas of love. <laughs> I mean, come on. I mean, that's the you, next movie. What are you making a movie for if you can't do that? <laughs> right? You can't, I mean, Tammy, if you can't solve the mysteries of human relationships, I should just give up in like an hour and a half. <laughs> you know, like, why are, why are you even making movies? Right, exactly. Um, well, you know, um, so I saw the film, and uh, I thought um, uh, it's a lovely movie. Thank you. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, uh, we talked a little bit about the making of it and so yeah. forth, and I know you didn't have a ton of dollars for it, but it certainly doesn't show. Thank you. Um, and uh, what I was, you know, because I'm, I'm critical, and one of the things that I noticed, I noticed things like production design and yes. costume design. so and important. The You know, everybody... I don't know if you had this, but like, and it's sort of a tangent, but like, I get people saying to me uh, when I want to do a project, what are you going to shoot it on? Hmm. And I'm like, I don't care. Mm-hmm. I'm going to shoot it with a camera. That's right. Um, what are you putting in front of it? Right. Because you can have the greatest red camera in the world or, you know, whatever. I you 100% get, agree. You know, you can shoot it on the Alexa. Yes. But, you know, if you're shooting something that looks like crap, it's going to look like crap only right. in really high definition. In really high definition you know? crap. Isn't that uh, what you want to watch? <laughs> but uh, I think you you had a great DP on, on, yes. the, on the picture. Talk to me talk to me about a little bit. We'll see. This is one of the things I wanted to get into because I've interviewed several actors who yeah. become directors, um, and we're and this happened to actually several women. Hmm. This seems to be a, a trend that you're oh, a part like of. I like that. Um, I like that now, trend. If if I have any more women on this show, it's going to be called the Women in Film Podcast. <laughs> uh, I'm not mad about that though. But like, uh, it's uh, it's cool. But uh, one of the things uh, that I wanted to kind of talk about that I haven't talked about before is because you're actually in front of the camera. Yes. What is your relationship like with the DP? 
Very and, close. Yeah. So, and, I'll and, explain to you how we did that. Yeah, yeah. Tell me how that works. Tell me how it works. Yeah. Um, so, first of all, my DP is a wonderful woman named Chloe Weaver. Um, this was her first feature, although she's worked a ton uh, before this, but this was her first feature as a uh, director of photography. And um, we had been meeting with a, a couple of folks who didn't work out, that as often happens in independent film. We were scrambling, and I thought, this is bad. Um, we are don't have a lot of time, and this is probably the one of the most important positions ever to have this movie go well. We need to find this person. So Chloe and I met um, a week before we started shooting and immediately were speaking the same language. The references she pulled, I was like, we're, I think we're going to do okay. But we... It was funny in the middle of the shoot. I was like, I think I like you as a person. I, I don't know you, but, but we're having a good time doing this. And this is really working in the work sphere. But I think I would like you outside of this. But the way we did it, because um, I'm in so much of the movie and also directing, um, was we had we kind of came up with this little system that worked. I had a fantastic assistant who's also an actor. Um, Katie Rediger, who was kind of my right hand woman, and she would step in for blocking rehearsals. I would often be off camera, saying the lines, w seeing the shot set up, watching, making sure it was how we wanted it to look. And we were in really, um, we were in constant communication. And then we would, when we were ready to go, we would. We would shoot a take, and sometimes I relied on Chloe and Brad, my producer, and Katie, uh, and our scripty, who are all watching, that we got it. But, you know, for me as a director and as an actor, I, I would know if we got it in the same way I knew we got it as an actor. I could feel that we got it. Could I see every single thing that happened in the frame as a director who wasn't in the movie? No. And so it takes a lot of trust. Occasionally, we, I would watch playback, especially in the scenes where we shot things in one. And that's a really risky thing to do because, as you know, you can't uh, go back and edit. And there were a couple of those scenes in the movie. Those I watched, I watched all of the takes and made sure, yes, okay, we have what we need. Um, and I would sometimes watch things if there was a question, but we didn't have, we're making an independent movie. There's not a lot of time. There wasn't a lot of time to watch playback. So it was this little system that we had going. And I did have a lot of women on the set, which was cool. I had both I had both men and women, which I think is important. I liked having a mixed set, so I had different opinions. And um, I had fantastic actors. So they we didn't have a lot of time, but we, we made it work. And they, I have to tell you what, um, what was happening and what I saw. And I was also editing the movie in my head as we went, which is also really... Um, my brain can do a lot of things at once. So that was helpful. But, you know, the other funny thing is that Rosemary, who is my character, you know, she directed most of the movie. I couldn't exactly go from being uh, a director to jumping into a scene and having those relationships and those dynamics work. So on the one day that Rosemary did not direct, where I was not in any scenes, everyone was like, who's this director that showed up? Because it was very different. Um, but my actors were really willing to try anything and had eventually, I think, had... Uh, trusted me but it takes a little time you know it takes time to gain that trust even um even even with those guys who are willing to to dive in from the the minute that we started how much time did you have on the shoot uh 18 days whoa yeah that, so you're you're cooking yeah we um, were cooking and uh, there was the movie was longer we have a lot of things that were yeah. cut so um one of the things that we talked about a little bit and one of the things that i think it's important um when I spoke to an actor called Alan Lewis Rickman, mm -hmm. he was saying about like you know things you should do, and mm -hmm. this guy has been a working actor for twenty years, mm -hmm. so he's really experienced. And he's like, well, the first thing you have to do is know what your superpower is mm -hmm. as an actor. Like, what do you what do you really get at? And then when he he talked about making something like if you're going to make your own work, yeah. if you're going to generate your own work, yeah, don't just make it a vanity project. No, don't, don't just make it like look at me, look at me who's this for like right. is there an audience for it right so the question i would want to ask you is yeah who is this for like who is the who is the audience for this movie it's it's a really good question part of the part of it we i kind of had an in, inkling about um because this started as a play we i got to see um even though it's different 
see this with a live audience and see who connected to it. Um, uh, I would say that our audience is w one of the things that was the most surprising to me. Like I wasn't surprised to find men and women in their 30s and 40s who'd maybe um, been through some relationships before. I wasn't surprised to find that those people connected to this movie and especially women and, and even some women in their late 20s who were kind of about to like go into that changeover into 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 second a second adolescence happens in your late 20s, I believe. Um, but what was really surprising to me is that there were people who had been married for 40 or 50 years that really connected to this movie. Um, and we're remembering what it was like to fall in love for the first time and also what it was like to be married. And um, the biggest compliment that you can, I think you can ever get as a director is when someone goes, oh, I saw myself. I saw that's me I, or I know that guy or I was uh, married to that person or that's my ex-girlfriend or my ex-boyfriend. And when people see themselves, because I think that is one of the, uh, the it's one of the points of movies is, and art is to reflect, you know, human beings and what we go through and hopefully uh, make people laugh, too. It's essentially you'd call it a romantic comedy. It's a, it's sort of that uh, it's sort of a coming of age story. Mm -hmm. uh, girl moves to L.A., mm -hmm. girl meets boy, uh, blah, 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 ensues. Uh, and but what I liked about it being the fact that I'm not 22 anymore is the fact that there were some really. There's a lot of realistic dialogue. Thank you. Um, especially like a lot of the pillow talk type the stuff. Pillow talk, oh, uh, yes. And um, not referencing the Doris Day <laughs> film, <laughs> but like which is a great film. But actual talk that you have with somebody <laughs> on a pillow. Um, not only between you and I don't remember the lead actor's name. He's uh, Matthew Del Negro. He's fantastic. If uh, you don't know him, the two the not only between the two of you, but between the two people who play the married couple. Yes, that's um, uh, Jennifer LaFleur and Evan Arnold, who are fantastic. And it was just a great juxtaposition kind of between yeah. sort of like uh, young love, or as, as I call it, young stupid love. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, which can happen at any age. Which can happen at any age. Um, young meaning the, the love is the young. The love is young, right. Uh, it does, doesn't have to mean that the people are, you know, uh, 16. But uh, the juxtaposition between that yeah. and... The, the people who have been married already. Right. Um, and some interesting things happen. I won't spoil the film. Um, but I thought that was also pretty realistic as well, where you have people making sort of real relationship and life decisions as opposed to, oh, it's fate or, yes. you know, a deus ex machina. Right. Uh, everybody gets married at the end. Right. And, you know, that kind of thing. That kind of thing. Uh, you weren't making When Harry Met Sally. No. Um, and I think, you know, maybe uh, time-wise, maybe that the time for that movie has passed. Maybe. You know, maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, it's funny because I, I love all of those movies um, and grew up watching those movies. I think one of the things, even some of the ones that were written by women, uh, most of them are directed by a man. So we're, we are often in the perspective and one of the things that happened when I when people were reading the script is they would it was really um, disconcerting that the the movie was about a woman that the main character was really it was from her perspective a lot of it um, even though it's an ensemble piece and I think that life is relationships are really complicated and I wanted that to be in this movie I didn't want to tie everything up I wanted people to think think about things and and make some of their own decisions and you know I don't know the answers to this but I think that both of these things can be quite beautiful young stupid love as you put it and uh long time married love and I don't think one is more uh valid than the other or more real than the other they're just different and I think that they um uh they have their place and I think we often think the grass is greener so, you know, Nora Ephron wrote When Harry Met Sally, yes. but it was directed by Rob Reiner. That's right. And Rob Reiner's a wonderful director. An amazing um, director. And, you know, you've seen that throughout history. And right. I, I am, um, I hate this notion now that right. only women can direct women's stories. I do too. And, and like vice versa. It's not true. Um, because my favorite example on the flip side is Catherine Bigelow. Right. She directed Point Break, the right. greatest action thrill ride bromance of a generation. Ever. Um, and then, you know, you have such great 
female characters being written and directed by men. Absolutely. I can think of so many directors doing that. One thing I loved about your film, though, is the stuff that I would never think to put in it. Oh, cool. And... and it's strictly because I'm a dude. It's because you're a dude. Yeah. But uh, because we won't, there's a scene, and I won't like I won't spoil the scene. But there's a scene where you first meet May. Yes. In the bathroom. Yes, and my whole audience uh, when we were and, just premiered, there was a whole where women were responding to that right. moment. And you know that's something I'm like, why is that in the movie? And then I was real uh, realized I was like, oh, because that's something that's hap- that happens. And it's I a just, setup for her storyline. Right, exactly. And which it's we also, don't know. Which, but like, I don't see that. That happened to my friend. When you watch this movie, um, that is a real story that happened to my friend, who I won't name, who was in the audience of my play. And that hap- th- this opening scene that where we meet the character May, that really happened to her in real life. And I think that there are those things that, you're right, uh, a man might, might not... Um, just might not think of that that's it because it's not their experience and that's uh, and by the way i love men hi guys i love you (laughs) and i love writing men and i think men are wonderful can i pay you another compliment by the way oftentimes when i see female driven pieces yeah the woman is strong only because the men are weak oh i hate that and she's sort of strong by comparison right or they have to find some way to like disable the men in some way no 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 but um the what I liked about it is that uh, the two, ma- the, well, the three main men in mm-hmm. the movie, um, they seem like real people with cool. like real points of view, um, and they also like usually in one of these situations, there's like sh- there's the sensitive guy, yeah. who she should be in love with, right. and then there's like the really hot guy who she falls for, and he turns out to be a total douche, and then like this. It's the, never that. It, it wouldn't it be great if it was that easy. Though? I mean, but <laughs> but. In movies, you That's always see this do. thing where you right. have the ex, and the ex is such a horrible person that you're like, why, why, why would that person be with this person at right. all? Um, but I, I like that. Um, I appreciated the men, and I also liked that you know your character is being informed by them. Yes, not she never loses her agency. She right. never loses her uh, ability to make a decision. She comes to everything on her own, but she's not. She's not so strong that she doesn't listen to the men, and they're also not controlling her. You or know? yeah, I agree. Or uh, her, or the other female character who's in a different life place. And I think that, to for me, that's it's that's just more what my real experience as being as a woman are like. You know, again, I don't hate men. I love men, and the relationships, friendships, and romantic relationships that I have had with men have changed me have changed uh who i am as an actor as an artist a writer i've been influenced by men and why is that a bad thing i've also been influenced by women and that's great i think that there's um there's there's room for there should be room for both things and i certainly do not believe that having strong female characters means having weak female characters i think ever i my favorite movies are where characters have flaws and um, have things you love about them and things that maybe you hate about them. I don't know. That's just me. Well, you know, Rosemary, a, she's a... She's a tough... She's a flawed character. Yeah. She's, which is what makes her, like, a real person. And that, and I think, of all the things, the, the greatest strengths in the movie is the dialogue. Thank you. Uh, realistic dialogue and realistic performances. The people seem like real people. They don't seem like... Uh, our archetypes or caricatures like yeah i try you know. to go again i i try yeah. to in in a lot of ways to subvert some of those archetypes i mean some of the opening of the movie again not to give it away but starts with a lot of traditional romantic comedy tropes that we've seen um a character bumps into another character and that's how they meet. They're things we're all familiar with because what I want is I want the audience to be like, yes, I know this space. I know where we're going. I've been here before. And then we go somewhere else. And that is what um, I think that's why, um, you know, if you watch the first 20 minutes of the movie and you don't continue, you're going to miss where it goes. Um, but I then the thank you the performances in this movie I think those the actors my five lead actors all my supporting actors Billy Aaron Brown is the other guy and uh, who plays my best friend are they're 
they're some of the best actors I've worked with. And I think um, hiring and finding the right people is just, it's tantamount. Like I, I couldn't even deal with one dialogue, one line of dialogue that felt false. And if it did, you know, we had a script, obviously, and we stayed very close to it. But if something wasn't working for an actor, I would say, what, what do you want to say? What, what, let's make this work because otherwise I'm going to have it in the editing room and it's not going to, I'm not going to be able to do anything with it. Right. And it can really derail everything. A whole, a uh, whole movie. I, I got to wrap up, but um, I hope that, you know, in a world of comic in a book, world. In, a, in a world, <laughs> uh, I'm auditioning for voiceover for uh, trailers, uh, but in, in a world of like comic book movies, giant robots, yeah. monsters, yeah. Uh, car chases and explosions, uh, maybe we do get a few more movies about people and movies that are written for grown ups. Um, I don't know if that is in, in the theater these days. I think it's probably more on your know, streaming services and sure. cable channels. But I, I hope it's somewhere. I hope it's somewhere you know? too because those I, are the movies I fell in love and with. And I know you're touring the film uh, yes. the, the film festival circuit right now. Yes. Um, but uh, if somebody wants to know more about the movie, where can they find out? They can find out um, on our Facebook page, Limerence Movie. Is it Limerence the movie? I should know this, right? I'd be a better filmmaker. We're and I know we're on, we're on Instagram too. But um, if you look up Limerence the movie on Facebook, that's where like all the latest news is. You'll find our trailer. Great. Um, I got to wrap up, but thank you so much for coming. Oh, it's all, been a pleasure. All the way from LA, you're the the furthest guest to ever. Really? Before yeah, before you, the last oh. guy was uh, from the Bronx, so that was the, <laughs> that was the furthest. It's a little guy. closer. Maybe from no from Jersey, I think. That all was right. The furthest one. It's good. It's good too. The furthest out west was <laughs> Jersey. Anyway, thanks for coming. And, thanks so uh, much, Jason. Thank you for joining us. Uh, as always, thanks for, for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more episodes of this show, you can. Uh, Always find them on our website, btrp.nyc slash podcast. You can also find us on all the major podcast channels, iTunes, Anchor, Stitcher, Google Play, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'd like to thank my guest once again, Tammy Minoff. Thanks for coming. It's been a pleasure. And um, I'm for Behind the Rapper Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.